Hi, and welcome to another in our continuing video series of talks with interesting scholars and thought leaders on a variety of interesting, important, and timely topics. I'm your host, Rick Newman, Executive Director of the American Museum of Tort Law. Our guest today is Professor Dorit Rice from UC Hastings School of Law in California. She is a nationally known expert on a number of subjects, but for our purposes today, and in particular, on the law relating to vaccines. Welcome, Professor Rice. It's a pleasure to meet you. Thank you for having me. So here's the, we're a year or so into the COVID plague, um, and vaccines are rolling out, Pfizer and Moderna, and um, numbers of people, greater numbers of people are being vaccinated every day, which is all good news. Yes. And it's vitally important for public health. But the subject of today's discussion is what if something goes wrong, which leads us to consideration of the PREP Act. What is yes. the PREP Act? So the PREP Act, the Public Readiness and Emergency Preparedness Act, is an act to protect uh, manufacturers and providers of products during an emergency from liability. It's not specific to vaccines. Uh, and if the Secretary of Health and Human Services issues a PREP declaration that covers anyone making a medical product related to the emergency and anyone administering it. It's a very broad uh, act and covers a lot of people. Do you want me to talk a little bit about the COVID uh, PrEP yeah. Act? Yes. Tell us about how it pertains to COVID. Yes. So in, in February 2020, the Secretary of Health and Human Services issued a PrEP, PrEP declaration about COVID-19 that will be in place until 2024. And that covers anyone making products uh, during the emergency, not just vaccines, but also treatments, drugs, devices. And the rationale of doing that is to say, if we want products fast, we won't have the same level of safety testing that we do in normal time. And if we impose the same tort consequences, we just won't have the products. It's yeah. risk balancing. Yeah, so let's talk about that. What this basically means then is if some poor soul gets vaccinated and keels over dead, they can't sue. Or, they can't sue the manufacturer. Now remember that that's more of a, a apparent limit than a real one in the sense that to sue the manufacturer, you'd actually have to show more than that you'd killed over dead after the product. You'd have to actually show that something was wrong. And in an emergency, if you're bringing a negligence claim, that might or, or for that matter, product liability claim, that might factor into the uh, analysis. So it's not that you can automatically be compensated without the PREP Act, but you're exactly right that the PREP Act means you can't go to the courts for your damages if something happens. Right. Now, there are tremendous benefits to vaccines. They save lives. There are yes. a tremendous advance in medicine and in public health. So. I come down fairly squarely on the side that vaccines are good. I'm all for them. But, but this policy of immunizing manufacturers raises some public policy concerns, such as, mm -hmm. is it necessary? Is it narrowly drawn? And most importantly, will it disincentivize people from becoming vaccinated? What do you think? So my view on this is a little more general than the PrEP Act. My view is, so vaccines do two things for people. One is they protect the per person receiving them. The other is by creating herd immunity, they protect everybody. Getting a vaccine is a personal good, but also a public good. For me, that means that the few people that are harmed by a vaccine deserves fa deserve fast, generous compensation. The tort system isn't actually geared up to do that very well. Uh, and it's not geared up to do that because especially in our system, our tort system requires showing fault. So you have to show the manufacturer did something wrong. I think that because vaccines are a public good, people who are vaccinated should be compensated even if they can't show that anyone did something wrong. Because in part they're acting for society, society owes them compensation. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I would say that our regular tort system is not the best way to deal with vaccines harms anyway. And I'm not alone. In 1953 in Germany, the uh, highest courts, the court, their highest courts found that a vaccine compensation should be no fault exactly because it's also a public good. And often people can't show fault. 
even if the vaccine causes their harm. So there are 19 countries right now that use a no-fault system to address vaccine injuries generally beyond an emergency. I think that's the right way. Now, there's another part of it, which is what's the effect on manufacturers taking caution, but let's focus on compensation now. So I think we need to have a robust compensation system for vaccines, mm -hmm. but the usual tort system won't do it anyway. The problem with the PrEP Act for me is less that it man uh, isolates manufacturers and more that it comes with a compensation program that's really hard to use and really limited and not generous enough. And if that's had an easy program, I'd be fine with it. Go on. Yeah, and that program, it's just so I sound like I know what I'm talking about, mm -hmm. is the Countermeasures Injury Compensation Program, or CICP. Exactly. How does that work and why isn't it working well? So working well depends on what you think should happen. Uh, the way it works is if you got one of those emergency products and you have an adverse reaction, you have a year to file with the program, you need to show by compelling and the strong scientific and medical evidence that the product caused your harm. Is and that the higher standard of proof? Clear and convincing? It is a higher, yes, it is a higher standard of proof than civil court. And it's a very high bar, especially for a new product, because at first you won't have as much evidence about the risks and benefits. So yes, it's really hard to meet that. Right, all the data isn't there yet. Exactly. And even if you meet it, this is a program of last resort. So if you have, for example, workers' comp or health insurance, they have to pay before the program comes in. So in its, its years of existence since 2010, this is not a very old program. Since 2010, it has compens it had found 39 claims that have merit and compensated 29 out of them. That's a very low level of compensation. So yeah. I'm okay with providing some protection to manufacturers and providers in an emergency, but I think the other side has to be a generous, robust compensation program, and CICP isn't it. And so what about the VICP, the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program? So I think VICP would be a much better option. So to give a bit of history, the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program was created in the 1980s in response to a litigation crisis around pertussis vaccines. Uh, there were there was a rise in cases. Lo uh, manufacturers were leaving the market. They were not saying, give us immunity. They were just leaving, doing something else because the vaccine was not profitable enough. They won most of the lawsuits, but one or two small uh, large damages were enough to kill the small profit from vaccine. Congress was worried about vaccine manufacturers leaving the market. And plaintiffs weren't happy either because it's really hard to show that uh, the vaccine manufacturer did something wrong. So there was kind of a combination of uh, support for adopting a non-competition -com no program. Uh, and the program adopted was designed to be generous and compensate in cases of doubt. So first of all, all you have to show is that the vaccine caused your harm. You don't have to show the manufacturer did anything wrong and damages. Mm -hmm. Second, the causation requirements are relaxed and relaxed in two ways. First is the table of injuries. That's a table of things that are known to be related to vaccine and a time frame. If you have one of the table injuries within the time frame, causation is presumed. If the government wants to show it something else, they have to do that. And it's really hard to show it something else. Right. Uh, so if you have a table injury, causation is presumed. Even if you don't, the doctrine for causation is relaxed compared to that in, re in uh, to, uh, regular tort cases. In regular tort cases, if you want to say a product caused my harm, a medical product caused my harm, you have to show general causation. You have to bring scientific evidence that the product can cause your harm. And you have to show specific causation that in your case, it caused the harm. Mm -hmm. In vaccine court, you still have in theory to show that, but you can meet general causation by bringing a credible expert with a plausible theory. So you don't have to bring actual scientific evidence. Okay. Expert with theory is enough to cover that. So that's a lower requirement than in civil court. Is now, it carve up from Daubert? Um, Daubert is, does not apply in a uh, right. court. Okay. Yes. They let in all kinds of experts. Now, if you bring an expert that says vaccines cause autism and the other side brings in studies in millions showing vaccines don't cause autism, you'll probably lose because right. the theory versus data, the theory still loses but it really helps when there's uncertainty and when there's no good data either way. 
So it's a much more generous program. It has a three-year statute of limitation, which is like what most states have, mm -hmm. much better than a year. It's a better option. I think that one of the things Congress can do to help with the vaccine situation is pass a law that says that COVID-19 vaccines are covered under VACP and impose the uh, small tax that is imposed on vaccine covered uh, under VACP on those vaccines as well. That would make it much easier for people claiming the vaccines harm them. And do you know if there's any legislation pending to, to get COVID incorporated in this? Not that I know of at this point. Interesting. Well, that's something that may develop in the future and we'll I see. I hope so. What about, um, this is a sort of a change of subject, but it's collateral. And that is, what are policies or programs to incentivize people to become vaccinated? I'm not talking about people who have a religious or a health exemption, a sincere religious health yes. or health objection, but people that just say, nope, I'm not getting vaccinated, ha ha. Can we have them sign a waiver saying, all right, you give up your right for medical treatment? Or we won't give you a ventilator? How do we so, deal with that? So that's a bit of a problem. Uh, and we didn't, for example, we don't deny medical treatment to people who have lung cancer because they smoked. There's a real ethical problem with denying medical treatment to people if you can blame them for their harm. But you can, for example, say, uh, vaccinating is a wellness program under the American uh, under the Affordable Care Act, the American Disabilities Act is separate right. from this. And then you can give people who vaccinate a rebate, for example, on health insurance premiums. There are limits to that, but that's one way. Another thing we're seeing is that employers are offering incentives such as paid leave and um, uh, actual payment, giving people who vaccinated in their workforce money. Right. So we could definitely do those. Can I go back to the compensation and add one more? Yes. There? yes. So one concern about having a, a no-fault compensation program is, does this mean that the manufacturers won't be as cautious? Mm -hmm. Are we undermining safety? Now, in an emergency, to some degree, you have to make safety um, compromises. Trade off. You, you, you won't have the same data, but we still want a high degree of safety. And my response to people asking about safety is to point out that it's not primarily the court system that addresses the safety of vaccines generally as well. We have a very high level of safety in vaccines and we have it because we have an, an elaborate regulatory system in place to oversee it. Not just the agencies, FDA and CDC, but also expert advisory committee that are independent from the agencies. And we have four monitoring system. So while you might be concerned that manufacturers would cuts, have short, uh, uh, shortcuts in relation to safety, or that will end up with a less safe uh, product, we have other mechanisms in place besides tort liability to help safety. All right, so in that sense, this carve out, the immunity for manufacturers isn't really taking anything away because there are other forces that require them to engage in quality control and thoughtful, thorough testing and marketing and design of these vaccines. Exactly, and we know they work because, for example, in 1998, when a, ro a rotavirus vaccine caused a severe reaction into susception, where your uh, intestines fall on you, uh, in one in 10,000, that was found out very quickly, and the vaccine was pulled off the market. So we have systems to find out if something's going wrong, even at a rate as low as one per 10,000. And there are strong consequences if a vaccine is shown to have a serious side effect, even if it's rare sometimes. Well, it's interesting, though, because there has been so much misinformation about vaccines, you know, that discredited study linking vaccines to autism, which has been thoroughly debunked. Yes. Nonetheless, has persisted now for decades. And there's this huge online movement of people saying vaccines are bad, they're not tested, they're rushing through it. And so it's, I guess, that that stimulated my desire for this interview today, because I'm just wondering if the, the fact that people might be able to recover damages could be used as a program to encourage people getting vaccinated. I think you're completely right. Having compensation in the background. So none of us go into our car uh, not worried about accident because we think there might be compensation. We'd rather not get injured, right? right. All of us. However, 
uh, having a short compensation can increase confidence. I think you're completely right in that. Yeah. Uh, and a move to a more generous compensation program could help build vaccine confidence. And I would add that anti-vaccine activists are certainly ca capitalizing on the fact that there is liability immunity to try and say immunity from liability means the vaccines are not safe. Right. That's not true, but they're saying it. And having a clear compensation program uh, might help with the other side of it, which you so nicely uh, described, which is the, the fear that something will happen and nobody will help me. So what it sounds like is this is a call for activists to yes. get the legislature, the, the Congress, to add COVID to the VICP, the Vaccine Injury Compensation Program, because yes. then people who are harmed, if any, by the vaccine could become compensated for that. Yes, that would be my recommendation. If you want to, if anyone wants to help both vaccine acceptance and the very rare cases of people that will be harmed. Uh, and you never, with a medical program that work, product that works, there's always a risk of rare side effects. That it, it does something to you. Right. So, uh, if anyone is harmed, they deserve compensation and they deserve it fast and easily. And VACP would be a good way to go. And what about the rejoinder that the idea of adding COVID to this would lead to enormous costs to the government or shifting those costs to the taxpayer or to the manufacturers and might also encourage fraudulent claims being submitted. So we're all there's always a chance every time you open the uh, ability to sue there's always a chance that people will bring unsupported claim. They don't even have to be fraudulent. People can just be wrong about the causal connection. VACP has special masters that have a lot of experience in dealing with vaccine issues. Uh, the program has been funded by a, an excise tax, tax on the vaccine and has now, right now, I think it has about a four billion uh, surplus. Uh, in other words, it's, it's a very uh, cost effective program from our uh, perspective. And I'm not particularly worried that this will change. First, I think there won't be that many people who will be blaming problems on COVID-19, I might be wrong, uh, on COVID-19 vaccine, I might be wrong. Mm -hmm. And second, I trust the special masters to be able to uh, sort out the uh, cases. What we might want to do though, if we're doing this is increase the number of special masters because if there are more cases coming in, maybe we need more people looking at them. Interesting. Well, this is very interesting. Thank you very much for taking the time to talk with me today. I think this is just very helpful, very interesting. And maybe we can get a groundswell of people to say to Congress, let's balance the equation, protect the manufacturers, but also protect anyone who's harmed by taking the vaccine. Thank Seems you. fair. Yes. Good. Thank you, Professor Dorit Rice. It's a pleasure meeting you. I'll talk to you again soon, I hope. It's great meeting you. It really is.